Very good. Thanks again. Well, I don't know. I'm going to have to hold this. If that's okay with you guys. Thanks uh, so much, Sharon. Um, thanks to Books and Company again for hosting another one of these. I want to say a special thanks to my colleagues at the University of Dayton, many of whom are here. Um, UD been very, very good to me. Uh, over the years, it's just been a terrific place to work. And um, I'm currently team teaching a class with Professor Flockersy over there. And I was just thinking today how uh, great it was to have the intellectual stimulation and, and play off each other's ideas. I want to thank um, uh, the university, especially uh, uh, my chairman, um, Juan Santa Marina, my former chairman who's sitting back there, uh, Julius Amen, for their terrific support over the years. I uh, couldn't have done this without them. Dean Paul Benson, I want to uh, thank him. And I'd like to extend a word of thanks to my co-author, who <laughs> obviously not here, he's in Arkansas, but we developed a tremendous uh, writing relationship. Uh, he actually had reviewed Patriot's History of the United States on Amazon. And his line was, uh, you know, a wonderful book, but not without its flaws. And I went, what? I don't have any flaws. What's this guy talking about? Well, back then on Amazon, you could uh, put your email in. And so I got a hold of him, and I said, hey, uh, I want to know what the flaws are because I want to fix them for the next edition. And I will pay you if you will do a copy edit of the book and, and, you know, in your opinion, tell me what every flaw is. So he sent me back about 20 pages, <laughs> single space. And, uh, and they weren't all mistakes. A lot of them were uh, challenging my interpretation or having a different uh, slant to something. Uh, but we developed a working relationship. And eventually, uh, we ended up uh, writing uh, books together. And so far, we've written three books together, both volumes of Patriot's History of the Modern World and the Patriot's History Reader. Um, before I get into Patriot's History of the Modern World, I should announce that Patriot's History of the United States, believe it or not, is in its 10-year anniversary this year. Just uh, amazing to me that it was 10 years ago that this book came out, which <laughs> was 15 years ago that I was working on it. But nevertheless, the publishers decided to release a special 10th anniversary edition uh, later this year, probably in November. So all uh, winter, I've been updating Patriot's History of the United States and editing it to bring it up to the present. So that's going to be uh, fun. This book came to be after Patriot's History of the United States. Already back then, before some of these other books, I was thinking about doing a history of the world. One of my favorite books ever is Paul Johnson's book, Modern Times. I thought not only is it a great study of history, but it's wonderfully written. And I, I thought I, I want to be able to do that for uh, world history. I'd like to be able to tell the story of the whole world that way. So I'd, I'd been thinking about this book for a long time. And when Dave came into the picture, he seemed like the perfect co-author because he was strong in a lot of the areas where I'm, I'm weak, uh, military history especially. And Dave is, is uh, really very good at that. We submitted a book about that big to the publisher. And you can imagine the reaction, you know, Patriot's History of the United States was too big as it was. This is ridiculous. So um, they split it into two books. And as you can see, even volume two didn't get all that much smaller. But originally, volume two and volume one were one book that we submitted to the publisher. Volume one came out in Death Valley. It came out in October 2012, right at the peak of the presidential election season. It had no chance of getting publicity. I did a grand total of one radio interview, and I'm, I usually will do 100. And, and all they wanted to talk about was the election. <coughs> but over and above that, volume one's a dark volume. It's two world wars and a Great Depression. There's not a whole lot you can do to woo you know, make things fun and, 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 and lighthearted with, with that kind of material. So it, it is a, a more difficult read, I think. Volume two, though, is fun. It's fun in a lot of parts. It's fun because you had a lot of different things, culture, education, entertainment, uh, the internet, all the things that uh, Sharon mentioned are in this. So I thought tonight, uh, some of you are familiar with my talks, and I'm usually pretty political. I thought we'd stay away from that tonight and deal with some of the more fun cultural stuff. Um, and uh, so I thought I'd start off talking a little bit about the golden accident. 
Um, America in the immediate post-war period uh, entered a, a, an economic time that I call the golden accident. Um, that's not to say that American entrepreneurs and, and workers and owners didn't take advantage of it. But what we had at the end of World War II was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity and challenge. And it was the fact that all of our wartime enemies were devastated. Japan was flattened. Germany was flattened. But our wartime allies were equally devastated. Uh, the French had been beaten up for years and occupied. Uh, Britain had been bombed. Um, so everywhere you look, the United States stood as the world's leading consumer and producer at the same time. And I can't find another time in world history where one nation has existed in that kind of a situation, where it was both the world's leading producer and consumer as a result of these uh, circumstances. U.S. controlled 15 percent of world trade, 40 percent of world manufacturing. Those are pretty awesome numbers. And nowhere was this better seen than in autos or in the chapter we call Freedom's Chariots. Um, autos, according to one writer, made Americans, quote, transformed, winged, and invincible. A man on a throne, as writer E.B. White called an American driver. Industrial designer Norman Bel Geddes insisted that, quote, a free-flowing movement of people and goods across our nation is a requirement of modern living and prosperity. And a young theologian named Martin Marty referred to the altar of automobility. But it wasn't just Americans. I should mention that, that the U.S. produced in 1955 more autos than the entire rest of the world put together and would continue to do so until the mid-60s. But it wasn't just Americans who were enamored of the car. Autos were seen as a measuring stick of communism success. There were more cars per paved road in the USSR, but the US had 15 times more miles of paved road. Auto deaths in the USSR grew proportionately much faster than they did anywhere else. In Kazakhstan province, auto fatalities reached a shocking 41 per 100,000 people. That's uh, pretty bad. That's almost as many inebriated students as UD would have on a given night. High, high percentage. Um, Fordism. Cars became a staple joke in, in the Soviet Union, and managers talked of Fordism, how we want to copy the Americans and their production uh, capacity. And, and yet, their cars came up a little bit short. As one Russian joke said, in Russia, owning a car brings joy twice, once when purchased, once when sold. Another Russian proverb said, in Russia, there are no roads, only directions. There was an auto plant near Gorky uh, that was supposed to be the highlight of the Soviet production facility. It featured green spaces, parks, apartments with bathtubs and showers for workers, which was highly unusual at the time, but no cars in this car production facility. Not until five years after it opened did the entire Soviet auto industry produce the number of cars that this one plant was projected to produce at the time it opened. As with everything, though, in the USSR, cars and car ownership came with severe criminal penalties for doing anything not permitted by government. If you jumped in line to buy a car, if you bought a car outside of authorized dealers, if you speculated in cars or spare parts, if you stockpiled fuel vouchers, that could all land you in a gulag or worse. Uh, this is pretty much true throughout much of the East Bloc. The East German Trabant was labeled in 1975 one of the worst cars in the world. It was powered by a two-cylinder engine. We have lawnmowers that have more power than that. And it, it was obsolete even at the time it was designed. Trabant engines, according to one observer, smoked like an Iraqi oil field. According to two communist economists who wrote an epitaph for the Soviet economy in the 1990s, they said, quote, while over in America they made automobiles and flexible production systems, we put an emphasis on organizing ministries and departments. They created work while we tried to cultivate the new man. They bought raw materials and produced cars. We sold raw materials.